Hello and welcome to April's edition of the Lead Out Cycling Weekly's monthly racing show. My name's Paul Knott and this month I'm joined by Cycling Weekly editor Simon Richardson and Cycling Weekly news writer Alex Ballinger. Before we get on to previewing the cobble races, let's take a look back at the headlines from the previous month. Julian Alaphilippe took his first monument title of his career, winning Milan San Remo after attacking on the Poggio and winning a reduced bunch sprint on Via Roma. This wasn't Alaphilippe's only big one day win in Italy this spring, as he took victory on the gravel roads of Strada Bianca earlier in the month. Egan Bernal reaffirmed his status as a genuine Grand Tour contender, winning Paris Nice ahead of countryman Nairi Quintana and teammate Mikhail Kwiatkowski. Primoz Roglic snatched the overall victory away from Adam Yates at Torino Adriatico on the final stage time trial, winning by just one second. And it's been confirmed that Team Sky's search for a new sponsor is over, with the British team to be called Team Ineos from May's Tour de Yorkshire after significant backing from British billionaire Jim Ratcliffe. A bumper month of racing there, with the highlight being the first monument of the season at Milan San Remo, where probably the strongest rider in the world at the moment, Julian Alaphilippe took his first monument of his of his career. He's just been absolutely unbe unbeatable already this season, hasn't he? He's been unbelievable. He's won every kind of race that you could possibly hope to win. For a small rider as well, he's only 62 kilos, but he's won a time trial, he's won a bunch sprint at Torino Adriatica, also won a puncher's uphill finish there, and then went on to win San Remo with a bit of both, with a bit of climbing action, and then a, and then a reduced bunch sprint at the finish. But he seems to be like the the real great hope for for France. I mean, he's not a he's not a Tour de France contender, but if you look at what he is winning, he's he's got he's a really exciting rider. He's really charismatic, and he's winning big races as well. And then when you compare that to the likes of you know Bardet and Pinot, who are the other big French riders, he really is doing a lot more in a very different yeah. in a different arena to those guys I think so I think he really is the big yeah big French hope for the team for their country mm, mm. yeah and he's kind of like stepped into the shoes of Sagan winning on every kind of terrain and obviously winning Milan San Rio maybe not seen as his potentially perfect parkours but like maybe Flesh or Liège was maybe him but he obviously proved on on Saturday that he could he could do that yeah I wouldn't be surprised to see him win either or both of those races yeah um, and it seems to be he's, he's leading a, a crop of riders at the moment that, yeah, from your Sargans and, and Valverde over a few years ago to your Yates brothers, that there's, there's a real strong crop of riders who can climb, but have a real punchy sprint at the end of it. And there's, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're all really strong at the moment and winning, winning across the board. Mm. And we're seeing a real shift with Milan San Remo. I mean, the last three editions, I mean, it's always known as a Sprinters Classic, but the last three editions, we obviously had Alaphilippe winning this year. We had Alaphilippe two years ago with Kwiatkowski and Sagan, like kind of reduced bunches. And the, you don't see like this mass bunch of sprinters now going to the line. Are we seeing the shift in how that race is actually being won? It's kind of a bit it's strange that this is, it's, it's may not, it may be an anomaly. It may just be yeah, a three-year spell, it, but. It does seem to be the case that the, the sprinters really have been missing out lately and much to their frustration. And you can, you can see earlier on as well that it's not going to be a sprinter's race. It's not like his last minute clips off the front, you know, in the final kilometre there winning it. It's on the Poggio that it's being lost for the sprinters. Viviani, um, who was obviously the sprinting hope for De Koenig quick Quickstep, he was sort of quite a long way back in the peloton on the Poggio and it looked like they weren't even really riding for him. And the pace up the Poggio is just phenomenal as well in the last couple of years. I mean, this year it was the fastest ascent of the Poggio since 95 and that was Jalabert and Fondurist who were a two-man move back in the 90s. Um, and so the fact that they're going up at such a pace is dropping so many sprinters and even even some of the all-rounders like Sagan, who are slightly heavier, really struggle when they finally get over the Poggio because of the effort they've been forced to put in. So I think the sprinters teams are really going to have to rethink their tactics on how they approach the Poggio and how they try and get riders over there and try and control the race themselves a bit more rather than hoping that a, that a puncher's attack doesn't get away. They're going to have to try and do something to prevent it getting away. Yeah, and you mentioned Sagan there. I mean, he misses out on Milan San Remo again. I've always feel bad about critiquing Sagan because he, he did finish top 10 again as per usual, but <laughs> it's obviously it is still one of the monuments that he is missing. He's one Flanders, he's one Roubaix. And it, it, yeah, I mean, he was watching Valverde of all people, which uh, obviously you've got to watch him, but it's kind of surprising he didn't. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a bit of a question mark over Sargon's form at the moment, I'd say. Not, not quite where we expect him to be, but I, I assume he'll be there by the time we get to Flanders and Roubaix next month. Um, 
But yeah, I, I think anyone who's not on top of their game right now is going to struggle to hold on to Alaphilippe or, or beat him. But I think, you know, the, going back to what you said about the how you win Milan Samaima, it's always been about is it about a bunch sprint or is it a, a group gets away on the Poggio? It's a classic. What will win it this year? And, and it, it, it goes, it's, it's completely random, but you, you get these, um, these groups of um, patterns of the race. And I think, again, it goes. Back to what I just said about the, the type of rider we've got at the moment who are really at the forefront of the sport, you're out of Philippe's. Yeah. Um, that sort of rider, um, they can climb really well and they've got a really punchy um, kick. They're not a pure sprinter and they're not a pure climber, they're somewhere in the middle. And um, Milan San Remo is perfect, something like that. And, and they're the riders that the sprinters just can't, can't follow. No, exactly, exactly. So moving on to away from the one day races to the stage races uh, for this month, we had two um, big races, Paris Nice and Torino Adriatico, both headlined by the Yates brothers. Neither of them actually won it. <laughs> one of them was very, very, very close. Adam Yates at Torino Adriatico, literally missing out on the final time trial by one second. It was actually made that possibly the most boring time trial that comes around every single season. Quite interesting, but yeah, he lost out to Primoz Roglic, who, um, if you didn't know already, used to be a ski jumper. <laughs> because, you know, that hasn't, has not been banded around at all. Never be mentioned. No, you know, never and if mentioned. someone mentions it again, I will probably shoot myself in the face. <laughs> but, yeah, Adam Yates was very, very close to not, making us not see that celebration, which is probably why I was probably the thing I was most annoyed about. It seems to be for the Yates brothers that heartbreak is just the theme of their seasons, doesn't it? You know, because you had Simon in the Giro last year, heartbreak, Adam then suffered in the Tour de France as well. And then this was, this was quite brutal, really. It would have been the biggest stage race of his career, biggest stage, stage race victory of his career. Um, and like you say, it's not the most, I, I quite like a time trial, but it is not the most exciting parkour for a time trial, is it? It's 10 kilometers out and back. Um, and the stage had already been won by Victor Campanaz earlier in the day. He wouldn't set an early time. And then, so it was really good that we then had this this last, last ditch battle for the GC and it couldn't have been any closer, could it? And it was absolute heartbreak really for, um, for Adam Yates, and he said that it, it did leave a bit of taste in his mouth, which I think he said about three other races in the past as well, where he's yeah. just come so close, but just hasn't quite made it. No, but it was good they, both, they both had good weeks, though. They both won a stage within the... And obviously, the looking strong. I mean, Simon himself was caught out in the crosswinds of Paris-Nice, but like you said, won a time trial, and with him going for the Giro again, he's looking strong. Well, you don't expect the Giro to be raced. I mean, it's chaos, chaos of the Giro, but the crosswinds of Paris-Nice are unique to it, so... For the Giro, he is looking very strong at the moment. I think it bodes exceptionally well for both of them, really. I mean, obviously, Adam Yates lost, very disappointed, especially when you lose by such a close margin. But once you get over that, you realise that actually he was good enough to win yeah. Torino Adri Adriatico. There's nothing, literally nothing between him and Primoz Roglic. It puts him at the forefront of the Grand Tour contenders mm -hmm. going into the rest of the season. Uh, we already know Simon Yates is a Grand Tour contender. He's won one. Um, and that performance of Ponis, again, make one mistake and you lose all that time. But actually, that doesn't... Um, that doesn't tell us about his form. The time trial does, so his form is there. Yeah. So he will be, he will be um, uh, up there when it comes to the Giro. And Adam also, when he um, gets into the Grand Tours this year, I, th I, th I think that his result in Torino suggests his potential yeah. for podium this year if things go well for him. Yeah. Um, I think it's looking really good for both of them. But from one mega team to another. Uh, team Sky have finally, well, I say finally, in terms of cycling, this is kind of very, um, very relaxed. They've got a sponsor before the Giro. I mean, we mentioned on our first show of the year, you and Yanto both sat here thinking they're, they're going to get a sponsor quite easy without each other. When I was a bit I'm like, mm, this is cycling. And I've been proved wrong, and you you were spot on pretty much. I mean, yeah, it's a lucky it's... guess. I mean, no, no, no surprise they found it. No surprise they found a sponsor. Really, one of the best sporting teams out there. Um, I, th I think the surprise is the size of the sponsor. Um, you know, there's talk that they've actually um, confirmed more money for their budget, um, which is quite an achievement considering they're the richest team in cycling already. Um, but what is quite telling is that they're jumping in. Uh, the first of May, sponsoring them, becoming team yeah. in Eos from then. So Sky, obviously happy to hand that over, lose out in the last six months of their um, deal, and just the tour, pass it over. The tour and, being the main thing, I mean that's exactly. Yeah. And and I guess it makes sense because once you've made that emotional um, disconnect, you know what's the point of lingering on? What you know, Sky, Sky obviously have made a decision to end it. They're not going to be. Um, 
making anything of the team because it, it's, it, it's already old news for them. So the best thing for the team is to hand it over to a new sponsor with all the enthusiasm who wants to get stuck in um, and make the most of that deal. So I, I, you know, kudos to Sky for handing it over and not yeah. just dragging it out. And well done for the um, Browser and his staff for, for bringing a, a big sponsor. No matter what you uh, what you think of him, that that'll be and his yeah, company. That, that that'll, is, that'll be the subject of debate. For, that is for months, one thing that we kind of come, have yeah. to bring up uh, from their press conference last year, the tour which I went to, um, which was very frosty to begin with, as Chris Froome, Sal Butamal, here and was all the the main headline. But we were all handed a present, given a presentation at the beginning about pass on plastic and each of us were given a water bottle and we were like this is how we're like following this initiative and now they are being sponsored by Ineos who make a bucket load of the stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah it's not exactly the best PR move but we're kind of in this area within cycling and obviously you can't the ethics of a sponsor when you're desperate for money and there's not that much sponsors coming into the, into the sport and there's a, a there's talks of them being greenwashing for Team yes, Sky and yeah. it's it's a very trick I mean you've yeah it I mean it's there's, there seems to be people that fall into two camps where people are either thinking that Team Sky is a bit of it it's been described as a mismatch by the former um, Green Party leader Natalie Bennett um, because of Team Sky's work against plastics and the team wanted to be plastic free by 2020 um, and whether it's a question of whether those things will continue because otherwise if they don't continue some sort of commitment that they've previously had it looks a little bit like it was just a PR campaign a bit of a cynical PR campaign but um, in the themselves are a massive um, plastic producer and solvent producer um, but they CO2 producer CO2 producer as well and they, they and fracker as well which will be very interesting long list, when they get to the Tour list. de Yorkshire first race fracking yes, yeah has there's been... already talk of um, protest because they're, they're looking to do some fracking in, in Yorkshire but I, th I think going back to the plastic thing you know and I, I think it's perhaps a little naive a, a a cycling team, in fact any sponsorship in any sport, but specifically a cycling team because they take on the name of their sponsor. They are there as a vehicle for sponsor of, of the person, the company, whoever, that puts money in. They are a mess they are there to deliver a message for that sponsor. For Sky it was part it, for Sky it was passed on plastic. That wasn't a team initiative. It was by virtue of the fact they are Team Sky, but that was an initiative of their sponsor putting the money in. You have a new sponsor coming in, they've got a completely different um, uh, plan for it that they are not going to take on Sky's no. PR campaign because they're not, they're not Sky. You know, that, that's what a cycling team is there to do. That's why you put your money in to get across your message. It's the message for Sky, mm -hmm. not the message for the cycling team. So that will, that's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wiping the slate clean and it's in us putting the money in and it's down to them to get across the message they want to get across. You know, how, how much Dave Browser wants to push back on that is, is, is down to him, but um, you are there as a vehicle for your sponsor and, and you get on and, and you push their, their brand if you take their money. This month's 30 second effort is just a simple yes or no question, which is should Strada Bianchi be a monument? There was a lot of talk over the last month. Obviously we've had a great race in the last few years and it's quite an iconic course and people have been calling for it to kind of become it a monument status even though there, it's not officially classified by any governing body or anything but it certainly is a great talking point within cycling so <laughs> so simon i believe you are saying that i say no strada bianca should not be a monument I, and uh your 30 seconds off you go well there are lots of uh, great races out there and we can't argue them for them all to be a monument strada bianca's only started in 2007 so it's a very young race um, whereas all the other monuments have been in there since almost the beginning of bike racing, they are the true heart of the sport. It's only 184 kilometres, or it was this year. The others are all probably in excess of 250 kilometres, and Strada Bianchi really couldn't be that distance at the beginning of March, so it's got no chance of going up there. Um, and it'd be a very different race if it would, and probably maybe poorer for it. So, no. That was good timing. That was good, that was good. That was one take straight out it was I, don't pretty know, decent. I don't know if I'm going to be as eloquent Pressure's as that on. that's the thing you put you laid down the marker and now, I don't know if I'm going to be convinced of anyone and now Alex has to say that why Strada Benke should 
be a monument. Good luck. It should be a monument because of the iconic imagery around it, I think. I think the gravel roads are such a unique way of racing that it really stands out in the calendar. The pictures that come out of it are much like those from Paris-Roubaix, I think, as well. And also the iconic finish up in Siena is really beautiful as well. And what I like is the fact that the women's race and the men's race are both fantastic races and they have reached a level of parity more than other women's races held alongside. It got more, women's race got more TV coverage. It's a fantastic race and I think we should make both of them monuments with two seconds to spare. <laughs> I like that, I like that. That was good waffling at the end though, but it did tidy it up quite nicely. Two great arguments there, but do let us know what you think about whether Strade Bianche should be a monument or not in the comments section below. It should. Shouldn't. Moving on to our Cobbled Classics preview. And before our guys analyze the field, we will throw it over to our Roman reporter, Gregor Brown, who caught up with Greg Van Avermaet before Tour of Flanders. Greg Van Avermaet, this year we know the team has changed quite a bit. Uh, some of the management's the same. The color is obviously different. How has the team changed for you to be ready for the Classics this season, if at all? I think we have a good group of riders around. We have strong guys. Uh, I think they, they, are, they have the knowledge of the races already, and that's really important for me, you know, where they know when do I have to move up and to bring me in position. That's one of the, the biggest important things in Classics, I think. And then uh, I think we have some strength and of course uh, we ho I hope that a few guys can make it to the final with me and then we can play a little bit from there. But uh, yeah, in the end it's, it's me that has to deliver this result but I'm pretty, uh, pretty confident that uh, we are still there. How's the racing different between those two from Flanders to Perry Bay? I think uh, yeah, Flanders' position is really important. You have to be always good position, always uh, really attentive from, from the beginning. Uh, Approaching the climbs on a, on a good way is the most important thing. Of course, you have to have, you have, to have the legs. Where Ruba is a bit more, uh, I would not say relaxing, but if, if something happened, I think you can still come back. And you don't. The race is never over. You just you always have to go go full and keep on riding, and then uh, I think you can still make a, a good result there. What's the lesson that you've learned from Flanders over these years? Is there one big lesson that you've taken away from that race? I think it's, 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 a, it's to be confident and uh, I think uh, I was using a lot of energy before quite early where I now try to stay as uh, calm as possible to the final. I think uh, yeah, it's, it's also a different with the, with the statue you have, you know, if you're, uh, if you're a leader from the team you can wait a little bit longer where I was sometimes uh, not really uh, the only leader so you have to take uh, a little bit earlier the, uh, the advantage but I think just stay calm and uh, to the final and try to play your cards there. Good to hear from Greg Van Avermaet there, he'll be lined up as one of the favourites for both the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix. However, he has not won the Tour of Flanders, which despite his supremely consistent record, finishing second twice and finishing the top seven six times, he's, the last six times he's finished, it's kind of one race he really wants to he does. take off. He does really want to win it. And I mean, being a Belgian rider, I mean, you've got to say that he's got to be the best rider to have never won the Tour of Flanders. You know, he's just so unbelievably consistent. He gets the race. He's just never had that. He's just never had that moment to really take the victory, I suppose. And he's won Paris Roubaix, which in in a lot of ways suits him less than than Flanders, you would say, because he's so strong on the climbs. He's really good on the sort of the less harsh cobbles of Flanders as well. Mm. And the race itself, it's obviously it does get tweaked every every few years, but there's certain sections where the race there's like pinch points and where the race can certainly be lost as well as won. Yeah, Flanders is basically won and lost in, in, in the positioning, the lead up to the climbs, really, mm -hmm. as much as on the actual couple of climbs themselves. I mean, uh, the three the three climbs that have become the staple of the race, the, the Cremont, the Koppenberg and the Paterberg, that now feature on the finishing circuit, they are what make the race. Um, but really, it's all about the run into those. Um, certainly, the Paterberg and the Koppenberg, you have a dead turn into both of them and very narrow. So if you're not in the top 30, you're pretty much out of the race or chasing all the way. Um, and this is where a team like De Koenig would do so well. They'll have a team full of Belgian riders who will have raced up those climbs since they were juniors. They'll know every inch of those roads coming into those climbs and they'll be able to get themselves into position and they'll have um, strength in numbers towards the end of the race and be able to support their leader or leaders. They've got multiple leaders. I think it's key when you're watching the Tour of Flanders on TV, we get in the Tour de France, like they're going up a mountain, it doesn't look that steep. The, the, with this, it, with the Tour of Flanders as well, doesn't look that steep. 
these are steep. Really are. These are really steep. Like the Paterberg in particular is like twenty percent section in it, and the camera just does flatten out the road completely. And you'll see with the Koppenberg people walking and even a struggle just to get their foot clipped in again. It's that well, steep. Well, you can't. It's, it's well, you can't. Steep, yeah. yeah, you need you need yeah. someone to hold you up, clip yeah. in, and then go again. And there will be people walking because. 200 riders don't fit onto that road that is what will happen and of course we can't talk about the tour of flanders without talking about the women's race 158 kilometers finishing with the same one two punch of the uh Oude Quermont and the patsburg as the men do and who do we think is gonna come out on top of that Annemie van vluten yeah to to she wants to try to be and that was her first spring classics win for quite a few years actually um which shows that she's got good early season form and might be targeting the earlier races more so than some of the later ones so she's one to watch um, yeah, I wouldn't like to say hugely it's going to win it with any of these races, no, to be honest. But Anna, yeah, Anna van der Breggen won it last year as well, so she's very likely. Um, Chantal Black's been looking really strong this season as well, so she could be a serious contender as well. And of course, Voss took a nice win at Binder at the weekend, so is she back to where she was a few years ago? That would uh, add another name to the mix, albeit another Dutch name to add to their dominance. Another but um, yeah, <laughs> to add to their dominance. Um, so yeah, it feels like it's maybe a bit more open than the last couple of years mm -hmm. when de Breggen and um, that's dominated, but yeah, we shall see. And then following on from the Tour of Flanders, the following week we have Parry Roubaix. So we're throwing back to Gregor Brown, who caught up with Luke Rowe. Luke Rowe, how does it feel to be on the eve of the big cobble classics, Tour of Flanders and Parry Roubaix? I think just excited. Um, you know, they come around once a year, they come and go like that. Uh, you can get it very wrong or get it very right and it can be a life-changing couple of weeks. Um, fortunately, I missed, unfortunately, I missed out on opening weekend, Newsblad and Kern to illness. Um, had a great week at Paris-Nice. So yeah, heading into these big races now. Um, they're a big part of the season that I really look forward to and, and base my year around. So uh, yeah, excited. Now the news came out recently, sky is ending. How important will it be for, for you guys to tick that box and finally get a cobbled monument in, in the list of wins You know, after 10 years? Well, yeah, I said before uh, in previous interviews that it's one area where I think we haven't succeeded, where we have in every other area. Um, you know, the Ard it goes without saying, the Grand Tours, the Ardennes, pretty much every uh, one-week stage race we've, we've won or been there or thereabouts. But the Cobble Classics, we've, uh, you know, we've won some of the smaller ones, we've podiumed in some of the bigger ones, um, but we haven't won a big one. And uh, I think that's one thing that the team and, and it would be great to win you know with still sky on your chest yeah. uh, if one of us could could land a big one it's for sure it's you know as I said before as well I believe we got the riders I believe we got the equipment the mentality the fight the the, the will to want to win um, but it's just got to happen and it's just got to happen on the day and uh, no excuses just put the balls in the line and, and try and deliver and uh, it's as simple as that really the riders tell me about the riders this year how is the roster so I think you kind of, uh, with myself, Ian Stannard, Dylan Van Baal and Johnny Moscon, I think we'll be the, the four guys towards the pointy end. Um, but then saying, saying that, you also had uh, Owen Dulu who finished second in Kern, so he's obviously stepped up massively. And then we've got a few guys who will rotate to fill the rest of the spots. Uh, Chris Lawless, uh, Ghana, um, a couple of other, Christian Nees, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we've got a pretty strong team there. When you, look, when you look through each one of them riders and look at their names, look at the Palmares, it's it's pretty impressive lineup. But uh, also a lineup that we put on the line last year and completely failed, completely failed. We didn't, we didn't deliver anything. We just got our prize money through for some of the classics and uh, looked at Pai Bay and we won zero, not a penny. So maybe the boss, Dave Brelsford, is asking, hey guys, where's the money? Yeah, not in, not in my pocket. Um, so yeah, I think, like I said, you can get it very right or get it very wrong. And last year, for one reason or another, you know, crashes, disqualifications, um, wrong place, wrong time. You can make excuses, but essentially we didn't deliver, um, which is something I think we're, we're all eager as individuals. Despite the team, you know, put that to one side. As individuals and personally, you just want to deliver and you just want to um, put on a show and, and uh, deliver a result. So I think we're all, we're all keen to do that, but it's easy sitting in a hotel here and saying yeah. we're going to do it to actually going out on the road and, and doing it. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed. That kind of shows how much fortune, good luck plays in those couple of races. 
Yeah, I think good luck can't win you the race, but bad luck can lose you the race. Um, you know, no, no one who's ever won one of these classics wins it on luck. But there's a long, long list of people who have lost them on bad luck. Um, so yeah, I think it's you know, you can, and you can put yourself in the right position time after time, enter in the crucial moments, top five, top ten, and and nail that time after time, and still get caught out in a crash or the wrong side of a split, and that's. That's also what makes the classics the classics, and that's why people love them and the excitement and watching the carnage unfold. And when you're on the other side of it, it's you know it's great if everything's going right, but the second it starts going wrong, it's like a snowball effect and it just all goes downhill. So uh, yeah, I think you have to have lady luck on your side, and uh, hopefully this is the year for that. When the team first started and they set out their goals and objectives and what they wanted to achieve, you know we almost got laughed at and. Uh, and you have and, you have improved in the classics, as and well. they've done them all. Yeah, and from a classics point of view, yeah, I think we've said it a few years in a row. We are knocking on the door, and we are. And if you keep knocking, it's, you know, eventually it's going to open. And you just got to, I think, persistence will pay off. Um, we've got to go into it hungry and ambitious, and and with belief. You know, you can't be like we just spoke about quick step, and you could say Sargon and Greg and these guys, but you can't be afraid of them. The second you're afraid of them, they've already beat you. So it's uh, you got to go in confident, puff your chest out, and, and back yourself. But at the same time, respect these guys because they're they're bloody good at what they do. Good to hear from Luke Rowe there, who will be lining up as one of Team Sky's main leaders this year, and they have quite a few options, quite a few options to play. Yeah, I would say they've probably got their strongest classic squad they've ever had. Really, they've got some real good potential. They've got guys that have done really well in races pa in races past and have won them, like Stannard as well, and guys that have been sort of near misses, like in some really big races. Like Luke Rowe's got a couple of top tens in pretty much every every class that you could you could hope for. Um, Moscow got a top ten in his first time in Paris Roubaix a couple of years ago as well, which was which was a brilliant ride, really really strong ride. Um, didn't quite manage to return to that sort of form there last year. Sky had a bit of a disappointing classic season last year. Um, there's also a question mark over Moscon potentially because he uh, crashed in the UAE tour and was really struggling um, in the races last week as well and had to pull out. So we'll see whether he's riding and whether he's at his best as well. There's really no key sections in Paris Bay in so much as everything's a key section because you, you can crash out at virtually any point or just lose a wheel at any point or you know be blocked by someone else who's made a mistake at any point. So it's, it's kind of like such a great race to watch because you're always on edge waiting for something to happen um, rather than just waiting for a key section of the race. Just just watch it all and enjoy it and, and um, look out for what the riders are doing. Uh, yeah, I mean Sky have a real blind spot on, on this race. They, they haven't had a result. Maybe this is their last chance and their current guys to do it. Whether or not they've, they, they've got the team to do it be um, Interesting to see. I think Stanard is, um, hasn't been firing on all cylinders for a year or so now, so I think it's on to the younger riders like Rowe, who was brilliant at Paris Nice, uh, Dool, who did well at Het Newsbad and, and Kerner, and um, I, I guess it remains to be seen how Moscon recovers from his, his crash. So let's move on to the favourites for both of the races, and I've got a. Do you want to hear a, a fact for fact sake? Yes, it may yes, not yes. be. It may be completely irrelevant. However, ready for this. <laughs> So ever since World War Two, when the year has ended in nine, you're intrigued, aren't you? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm hooked. What year is it? I'm hooked. The win <laughs> so it's 2019. When the win of the t the win of the Tour de Flanders has ended in the year of nine, they've gone on or become multiple winners. So one of the multiple winners could well be Peter Sagan, who has won Tour of Flanders. Right. I mean, you mentioned earlier on that you're not sure about his form going into it, but you can't really ever out and he did win Paris Roubaix last year as well. So I think for both races, he has the chance to definitely be up there knocking on the door, and we'll see how he gets on. What, what yeah, I'm sure his on. form will come in over the next week or so into those races. He'll be at a slightly higher level than he was at Milan San Remo because I'm sure he's targeting those more so. Um, so, yeah, a betting man would, would put a, a covering bet on him, I'm sure, just because you know he'll be up there, you know his bike handling is second to none, get himself out of any spots of difficulty, um, as long as he just doesn't snag any jackets on the railings. Really. Of course, of course. And then another guy, I know you're a big fan of Wout van Aert. He's been unbelievable this season yeah. so far. Um, he's just, every race that he's been in, he's just been, at, you know, in the top 10 basically and um, so he started the season quite late actually because he had his cyclocross season so he finished with the cyclocross world and then was allowed to start with uh, Jumbo Visma um, having left his previous team as well so he had a later start to the road season um, having ridden a full cyclocross season as well but then since then I mean he was third in Strada Bianchi which doesn't necessarily suit him 
that well because he's a heavier rider, but that was the second time you know he's finished third there. But he had his breakthrough ride there last year. Um, and then Strada, he was, um, sorry, in Milan San Remo, he was also in the top 10 again, and it, that might not necessarily suit him again because he's not a sprinter, not a pure climber, and yet he was up there. And I mean, the joy of these races is that you could probably pick out every rider that you think will be in the top 10, but you would never, you'd never be able to pick the winner really. You know, it's so hard to pick no. the winner. So I would say that he's going to be up there. Um, don't ask me who's going to win. <laughs> I <laughs> well, I may like ask you in a minute, but one, like one, I can't even pick a rider because the whole team, the Kerning Quips, Quick Step, have been on fire this year already, kind of spearheaded by Julian Alaphilippe. But when he doesn't win, one of his teammates usually does. And I mean, what yeah, do you think they're of their, their chances? They're unstoppable and these are their races. Yeah. Um, so you have to look to them. Everyone will be looking to them to control these races, I think, um, which may be the way to beat them, just to get them on the front and leave them to do all the work. Although they're probably not stupid enough to do all the work. That's, um, that's why they win races. But if there's a blue jersey that moves, I think you need to jump on it, really. Yeah. If, if you want to be in the chance <laughs> of winning or of sort of podium position, yeah, and one of the, the riders they had last year who is defending champion but has since left the Belden team, Nicky Terpstra, now with Direct Energy and kind of doing okay. Yeah, yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a surprising move really because you think that um, the successes that he's had have come off the back of being in one of the, you know, the strongest classics team in the world really and that he can sometimes sneak off the front and people will think, okay, I'm sure we can get Terpstra back, that'll be okay, and we'll catch him later. And then he's just gone completely. You know, um, Pyro Bay and Tour of Flanders, he won from from solo moves like this. Um, but he, so the move seems surprising, but he has actually been really strong. Again, it's the question of whether his team are going to be able to to really support him enough, whether they've got enough strong riders to be up there with him when he needs it as well. But so far in the one-day classics we've seen, he's been up there riding on the front, you know, putting in attacks and being really, really strong, even without the support of his teammates. So yeah. definitely a rider to watch. Yeah. And one wild card that I want to talk about, I know it's uh, <laughs> your favourite rider, Simon, Alejandro Valverde is lining up to ride the tour. Flanders. To win the Tour of Flanders, hopefully. And he showed his form at Milan San Remo and obviously we know what he's like with one day, well, races in general. He if he finishes, he will be up there and it could well be a race that's very, very suited to him. I mean, these punchy climbs we've seen with Flesh, he's won that yeah, It'll be fascinating to see. I mean, good for him for riding it and showing the World yeah. Champs jersey in, in those races. They should be in those, well, it won't be in Paris Bay, I'm sure, but you know, you've got to see the World Champs jersey in Flanders, haven't you? It'd be a shame for it not to be there. So good for him for riding it. Um, he's, he's got so much respect in the peloton that the, the battle for position that most riders have to um, contend with doesn't so much apply to Alejandro Valverde because he's Alejandro Valverde. Add to that, he's got the world champ stripes, and you just get let into gaps that no one else does. So he's he's in a very good position going into the race this year. Um, it would be really fascinating to see how he gets on. We'll see how they all go. But I'm going to ask you guys: give me a prediction for either race or both, if you're feeling brave. <sighs> So these, so these are all wow. uh, these are all publicly available because we've we've put our predictions out there anyway. So I think for uh, for Flanders, I think I went for Greg Van Avermaet because it's a nice story. I'd like to see the guy win it, you know, when he's wanted to win it for so long. Paris Roubaix, uh, I'm going to go with White Van Aert. Nice, nice. I must say we are filming this before E3 and Ghent Wevelgem. So if you've just said Greg Van Avermaet to win Tour Flanders and he crashes out this weekend, then that's maybe why, maybe why, don't yeah. come and abuse Alex directly. <laughs> yeah. Come and ask me again, I'll give you, you some know, more. We're, maybe he'll post something on his Twitter account. But um, So as things stand on Tuesday before Ghent and E3, who are you going for, Simon? Well, I wish I could remember who I picked yeah, for that, for I that piece. I, I have absolutely no idea. I think I'll go, um, plucking names out of thinner, I'll go for Stebar for Flanders. Um, just for the strength the team he's in and, and he's, he's had a good start to the year. Um, and for Roubaix, I think I'd probably go with Sargon again. Double up, mm. two in a row. Yeah, I think he might surprise people. It'd be a good story, yeah. Well, I know who I predicted for the article. I went very safe and I put Peter Sagan for both <laughs> <laughs> because he may... Why not? It's it probably win one. Basically 50 It probably win one. So, no, but it'd be... Two great races, and this is one of the best times of the year to be a cycling fan. So it'll be fantastic to see. Enjoy. So to close the show, we'll just do a very, very mini preview of 
Amstel Gold Race and Flesh Willow, the start of the Ardennes Classics, as we're not going to be able to get to them before next month's episode. But it kind of carries on the great racing that we, we've got in the next few weeks coming up, but, which, but equally fascinating races. Yeah, it wraps up the, uh, the Spring Classics for us. Um, Liège is definitely going to be an interesting one this year. They've changed the finish to it um, finishes in Liège again, which it hasn't done for, for quite a few years now. That's going to be interesting. It changes, it takes out the final climb as well. So in the last few years, it's just been basically uh, a bunch sprint for the climbers. And there's been a last minute attack from usually Alejandro Valvado, who usually wins. Um, but they've changed it now. So there's about a 10 kilometer flat section to the line. Um, I think it's still going to be too hard. It's not going to be a sprinter's race. It's still going to be way too difficult for, for any really, really big guys to get there so I think we could see a repeat of something like the world championships last year where you get a, a small group of, of sprinters making it uh, of climbers making it to the line and then sprinting for the win so so Julian Alaphilippe so Julian Alaphilippe yeah. well, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. but before that we have Amstel Gold and Flesh Wallone both two classic races and can we just say Alaphilippe again we could yeah, do just say that we look, could look do clever. yeah I mean typically you will get one rider who if they don't win all three, they'll be up there in all three. Yeah. Um, and we know the riders, I think, will be up there. Already named them. Um, Fresh will on. Seems to be a procession to the Hui, Murder Hui. Yeah. Um, then a sprint up the top of it. Um, but we might start to get a few glimpses of uh, Grand Tour riders again. They sometimes drop into Flesh and Liège. Yeah. Dan Martin's um, always showed. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I'd like to see the eights go, go into Flesh with, yeah, with a good yeah. bit of form, because I think that, that climb suits them even the age as well. So that, that'll, that's, that's kind of the segue out of the couple classics into that and we start seeing some people going for the Giro, riding those races and, and again showing their form coming out of Catalonia and um, onto those which just you know merges the two sort of types of riders we have and uh, adds another dimension to the race which is fun. Yeah indeed indeed. Anyway it'll be a fascinating fascinating month of, of races. Thank you guys once again for giving your insight and um, let us know in the comments below what your predictions are for the upcoming races. But until next month, thank you for watching and have a good one. Fortunate enough to learn off the best and I try and give a little bit of that information back. Luke Rowe, thank you. Thank you very much. That's good. That's good. Sweet. Piece of piss. <laughs> <laughs>